Hello there. I'm recording this from St James Norton, one of the churches of which I am vicar. St James was built about a hundred years after the Norman Conquest, and it's still full of many of the trappings of its medieval past. I'm standing in the Blythe Chapel, and to the right of me are the effigies of Lord and Lady Blythe, who bequeathed the money for this chapel so that people would pray for their souls for eternity. At the back of the church, is a font almost as old as the church itself with nine sides and strange carvings. Think of the tens of thousands of babies who will have been baptised in that font. Outside in the porch are strange gargoyles, strange faces, very weathered now, and yet probably 800 years old. And in the churchyard itself is the remains of a medieval market cross. I wonder what you think of when you think of the medieval church. Do you think of churches like St James Norton or the big cathedrals like Durham and Salisbury? The medieval world is a world so remote to our own. It was a world that was full of colour, full of festival. It was a world full of mystery, where church bells were rung to ward off thunderstorms, where the saints were figures who were almost tangible with us, where there were thin places between our world and the world to come, where life was uncertain and death always on the horizon. There's a place of kings and princes and dukes, but also of grinding poverty, of beggars, agricultural labourers. There's a place where pandemics could sweep off a huge part of the population in the course of a year. And it was a place in which the church thrived, and it also had its theology twisted and changed. So what are the characteristics of the church in the Middle Ages? Well, the first of those characteristics was wealth. The medieval church was by far and away the wealthiest institution in Europe, possibly the wealthiest institution ever to have existed. No sensible estimates of the wealth exists, but the church was a colossal landowner, as well as gaining money through tithes and through its own agricultural land holdings. Think of Apple and Facebook and Microsoft all rolled in together, and then with real power to rule as well. The contrast between the churches and the palaces being built and the poor of society couldn't have been more striking. And then there was the corruption of the church and the papacy, because nowhere was this wealth more evident than in Rome, where popes could gain so much money that becoming pope was akin to becoming a king. Elections to the papacy were deeply corrupt and resulted in wealthy Italian families owning the position, the Medicis and the Borgias being the most notorious. On the plus side, Money from the Vatican fueled the Renaissance and popes became the greatest patrons of the arts. On the minor side, it's hard to find any popes that had a spiritual bone in their body. Edward Gibbon, the 18th century English historian, wrote of the anti-pope John XXIII, 70 charges were formally read out against him. Fearing their effect on public opinion, the council decided to suppress the 16 most scandalous charges, never subsequently revealed, and accused the pontiff of simony, sodomy, rape, incest, torture and murder. I'll leave it to your imagination what the other charges were. In contrast to the corruption of the papacy, you had the poverty and the illiteracy of the clergy. It's true that most clergy had a smidgen of education, more so than the completely illiterate laity. But it still remained the fact that many clergy had very little learning. And yet clergy were given special privileges, such as being tried by church courts and not secular courts, meaning that they could literally get away with murder. These privileges, as well as the money that came from landowning, meant that many clergy had been ordained without any formal education. And yet there are so many of them. In 14th century England, about 1 in 30, 3% of the adult population were ordained. 
and in some of the bigger European cities, that reached 10%. Then there's the superstition of the laity. Popular religion in the medieval period is hugely controversial. It is now fairly clear that on the eve of the Reformation, popular piety was high in Europe, considering the low literacy levels. And it was relatively orthodox. Europe was not simply full of pagans with a veneer of Christianity covering them. But even so, the cult of saints and of relics grew exponentially in this period, with many people unable to travel to the big centres of pilgrimage like Canterbury. Local cults sprang up, and it's easy to see how the intercessions of easily accessible local saints came to be seen as important in popular spirituality. In the countryside, there continued to be a number of local pre-Christian religions, as well as practitioners of charms and magic, some of whom would later meet their end being burnt as witches. So you had wealth, you had corruption, you had superstition. And yet in the midst of this, there were serious Christians ordained and lay who wanted to get back to what the original church looked like or to, who saw a future in which the church didn't have to be like this. And there were three main responses to these problems in medieval society and religion. Monasticism, radicalism and reform. Monasticism had been around since very early days. The third and the fourth centuries saw many um, soul monks, many communities go out into the desert, Egypt, Palestine. They found ways in which they might purify themselves by cutting themselves off from the corruption of the cities and be pleasing to God. And so figures like Antony of Egypt, Benedict of Nursia later on, Saint Augustine, found ways in which by being a monk, by being a hermit, by living in community, they were able to keep their vision of what the faith should be like. In this country, the Celtic monks uh, took the retreat from the world and the ascetic lifestyle to an extreme, whilst equally being committed to evangelism, converting this country. And during the medieval period, we got the big orders of monastic life being founded, the Benedictines in the 7th century, the Cistercians and the Carthusians in the 11th century, the Dominicans in the 12th century. And by 13th century, there was barely a town in Europe that didn't have a monastery in its vicinity. A mile down the road from here, we have the remains of Beechef Abbey, built at the same time as St James Norton. The problem was that monasticism became beset by the same problems as the wider church. Monasteries accrued wealth and some of the foundations became fabulously rich. Rightly or wrongly, monks became known for their gluttony, their lust and greed. The prior of Whitby Abbey, one of the wealthiest of the uh, monastic foundations, kept a pack of hunting dogs. So monasticism didn't quite solve the problem. So what about radicalism? There are plenty in the church who sought a root and branch revolution in church life. Some of them were tolerated and even supported by the church. Many more were horrifically persecuted. The most successful of the radicals was St. Francis of Assisi, who managed to challenge the church about wealth and was able to teach and give a doctrine of radical poverty without bringing the wrath of Rome down on his head. Francis sailed very close to the wind, but he was orthodox in his doctrine, kept the right side of the fence as far as Rome was concerned. After his death, the Franciscan order was founded to his ideals. But in contrast to Francis, there's the Waldensians who are contemporaries of him and they were terribly persecuted. They also preached a gospel of radical poverty, but they weren't on good terms with the Pope. They ended up rejecting the institutional church altogether. They rejected the idea of a clergy laity divide. They rejected church traditions. They rejected purgatory, playing, praying for the dead and so they were persecuted and those who survived ended up 300 years later as Protestants.
So radical change worked in some places, but less so in others. What about reform from within? In the early Middle Ages, the church had some great reforming popes. Gregory the Great, the one who sent Augustine to England, was the most notable. They sought to rationalise and bring order to this huge institution that was the church, as well as to encourage those movements that sought to bring about genuine spiritual renewal. Spain in the 15th century had some strongly reforming monarchs who actually was a were able to lead the Reformation there so that when Protestantism burst out in the rest of Europe, Spain was left relatively untouched. Many attempts at reform were undertaken at the grassroots level without official sanction. The two Notable pre-Reformation reformers were John Wycliffe from this country and Jan Hus from Bohemia, present-day the Czech Republic. John Wycliffe was an Oxford lecturer and he survived being burnt because his points of view were convenient to the traditionally anti-church English aristocracy. Wycliffe argued that there was a difference between the true church of the saved and the false church which mixed the saved and the damned. And there was no guarantee in his view that popes and bishops were necessarily part of the true church. In fact, the church had taken to itself the power of rule that God had given to kings and princes. If the church wasn't infallible, then people had to return to scripture for the words of God. And then they would see that many of the Catholic ideas about the mass, about purgatory, about saints, would prove to be mistaken. Well, Wycliffe survived but his followers, called Lollards, frequently didn't. They often ended up being burnt at the stake. But the movement was a popular one and didn't wholly die out. And Diarmuid McCulloch speculates that if there had been one influential English nobleman who had backed them before the Reformation, then it might have been Oxford rather than Wittenberg, where the Reformation of Europe started. The other side of Europe, in Bohemia, the priest Jan Hus heard of Wycliffe's message and began preaching something similar. He began offering consecrated wine to the laity, and he sought to bring the mass away from the priesthood and back to the people. Hus was actually less anti-church, less anti-establishment than Wycliffe, but he didn't find himself in such a good position politically. He was betrayed and burnt at the stake. And his followers, the Hussites, were persecuted but remained a distinct Protestant group after the Reformation into the 18th century where they were known as the Moravians. And 300 years later they influenced another English radical and reformer, John Wesley. So even when these movements appear distant and put to an end, yet their influence still comes through. But you can't keep a tide from coming in. And the world was changing dramatically in the 15th century. We saw the first great voyages of exploration, the flowering of the Italian Renaissance, the development of the printing press, the growing intellectual awareness that there was knowledge to be acquired outside of the Holy Catholic Church. And all these things combined to make some form of reformation inevitable. As it happened, it was Martin Luther, it was the German town of Wittenberg which lit the spark. But it could have been Oxford. It could have been Paris. It could have been anywhere. The medieval church was changing fast. And the Reformation, which we'll look up in our next video, was one of the most significant responses to the changes that it was going through.